it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I had a little gap of a number of years when I stopped being chairman and didn't come to the conferences because I felt that it was time for other people to um, take on and do things and for me not to interfere. And it was really, when I came back to a conference, which I think was in Peterborough to speak, and it sort of felt a little bit like coming home because this was a place that I felt very comfortable um, to be with. So it's a great pleasure uh, to be here today. Oh, I'm doing the wrong one. Um, so I was asked to talk about perspectives on a life in tissue viability. And I thought about this and I thought, oh, I can cobble together something from another presentation I did last year. Um, and then when I thought about it, I thought, no, I can't do that. So where should I start? And then when I, as I thought about it, it became really obvious because where you start is the most per important thing in tissue viability, and that's the patient with the wound. And that's really where we're all coming from. It doesn't matter what job we do, we are having to deal with patients with a wound. So that was my starting point. And then I, so I then thought, well, I'll think about perspectives on clinical skills. And it's very true that tissue viability really started from very humble beginnings. Uh, and yet from that, we have specialist nurses and podiatrists uh, in particular, who have developed considerable skills in the management of a wide range of wounds. And you saw that from some of the bits, the snippets from the trustees. And really, this is the absolute bedrock of the specialty of tissue viability. It's caring for those patients and their wounds. But by its very nature, being a tissue viability specialist can be quite lonely because quite often you're the only one in your place of work and as part of the role you're expected to be involved in audit and the implementation of relevant research and findings and guidelines and this requires some knowledge and understanding of these topics so you also need academic knowledge now this is my little hobby horse so and i'm allowed because i'm doing this talk and you're not so if you don't agree with me, that's just tough. But I do believe it's really important. Of course, you have to have the clinical skills, but you also need academic knowledge or you cannot really apply them well. Um, and I think it gives you credibility with other professions and particularly with a medical profession because, you know, we don't want to just be the little nurse or the little podiatrist who gets patted on the head because we don't know much. We need to be people that can be equals. Now, looking back at this on the academic attainment that people acquired, when I started in tissue viability, which was the middle 1980s and on into the 90s, nurses were expected to undertake a relevant in EMB or equivalent course where the, and there was a lot of pressure to have a suitable tissue viability course. And it was a really, really hard thing because, no, um, because the EMB were not very interested in actually allowing us to have one. But since then, there's just been a huge change in expectation. We've moved to a degree-only profession. And many TVNs now have master's level degree and a few have re achieved doctoral level study. And that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I think it's important for a number of reasons. Professional credibility, I've already mentioned a little bit, but it does give you improved knowledge and research skills. And then there's the clinical academic pathway, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about in a moment. Now, as I've already emphasised, TVNs need a high level of clinical skills. But what happens when you start improving your academic knowledge is that we actually get better at debating with others. It changes the language we use. Now, when I started writing this, I was thinking, we use posher words, and I thought that doesn't sound very good. So I changed it to something with, that had a little bit more 
oomph about it. So I just think that you use words for greater impact. Now, you may not notice it. You may not be in the slightest bit aware of it. But just suddenly, you become better at debating. You get better at discussing things at a higher level. And it's really important. Now, the last job that I had in the NHS um, was not directly in... Uh, I wasn't working as a tissue viability nurse anymore. I was working in research. And I had a job which was, to me, was the most wonderful job. Part of my job, half of it, was facilitating others in the clinical field to do research. And then the other half was doing tissue viability research, mostly pressure ulcers. And what I found once I had my PhD was that all of a sudden it was okay for medical doctors to ask my advice on how to do research, how to... And, and I gave support and advice to a number who were doing their MDs. Now, that's not, that was not on the level of being the, their clinical supervisor because that's not what I was doing. What I was doing was supporting them in the practicalities of carrying out their clinical research. And I did the same for um, master's students as well. And I just absolutely loved it. But I don't think I'd have been doing any of those things um, without doing my PhD first. Now, one has to say that as you improve your academic knowledge, you improve your understanding of research and, re and you improve your research skills. If you look at the very early tissue viability research, he was pretty Mickey Mouse, and that includes mine. Mine was some of mine was pretty rubbishy too. And it, as I got further understanding about how to do research and what was required, I had a much better understanding of the importance of rigor in research and what had credibility. And me doing some of my little Mickey Mouse stuff with just me and a a couple of others and doing small numbers of patients in my hospital didn't really cut the mustard. And it's important, that, it's important to understand that that's not going to change clinical practice if you do that type of stuff. You may need to do that small stuff if you're doing, say, a master's degree. That's fine. But you have to understand that that's not the best research and it won't get funded. And if you want to do bigger and better research, then you've got to have the skills and you've got to work with others in a proper research team. And I think that we do have that now. We've got several research groups in varying aspects of tissue viability around the country. Um, at the risk of picking out one, just as an example, um, then I picked out the purpose group mostly because I was working within it. Um, but there's also a group in Southampton. There's a group here in York. Um, and it's brilliant. It's brilliant that these things are happening. And it's, you know, we need to recognise that this is the way to go when we want to improve what, you know, the type of research that we do. Now, that brings me, in a way, to the clinical academic career pathway. And I'm not sure if everybody was familiar with this. One of the things that was a great sadness to me is that unlike the medical profession who got the whole thing sorted, as a nurse, it was not possible for me to get very involved in research and maintain a clinical career because it just wasn't possible then. Um, but now that's changed and it is possible to do it and I think that's really exciting. So the clinical academic career pathway is a great opportunity and I'm going to show you a diagram in a moment to explain it if you've not heard of it. It means that nurses and AHPs can develop both clinical and academic expertise with the ultimate goal, if they wish, of becoming a clinical professor but you can stop off along the way like any, anything else in life. So this is great. Now, this is how it was set out. I'm not saying that this is how it currently works in practice, because if you look across here, where you've got the levels, they don't 
quite equate on where we would see ourselves. Um, because if you look at level five, so you might, in academic terms, you'd be thinking of a staff nurse level. Uh, I can't give you the equivalent in AHPs because I don't understand their systems. But So this is a pr practitioner consolidating and developing clinical knowledge and skill, but in academic terms would expect to be at master's level. And those of you who are nurse specialists sitting there thinking, well, I've only just got a master's level. That's it, you know, this is where it doesn't quite work for us yet, but I think hopefully it will in the future. Now, the MRES that I ref that's referred to here is a master's in research, and a great number of universities now have funding from the NIHR to fund nurses to do um, a master's in research. They do it mostly, it's done as a one year course. And it's a really, really good training for people who want to go on and do a PhD. So, level six. Um, junior sister level in, in academic terms. Senior practitioner developing specialist, specialist skills and knowledge and underpinned by theory. And that's really becoming an important thing. And then you move up to advanced practitioner, highly developed specialist skill and knowledge, underpinned by theory and experience. And this is where it's the clinical thing is really important. Is if you get funding to do any of these things, and there is also funding at PhD level, um, you are meant to improve at the same time as developing your academic skills, you are also meant to improve your clinical skills, or your management skills, you can also put that in as well. Um, so it's not just totally doing the academic thing. You are meant to maintain clinical practice in doing this, so, which is why I'm so excited about it. Um, and then they go up to postdoc, senior research fellow level, um, so that you, you still maintain. And the idea would be that you perhaps be doing one or two days a week involved in research, the rest still doing your clinical. Um, and so, although I'm not mad on joint posts, but there should be funding from within. Um, there is actually an, an IHR funding for, at this level, but you might also set something up with a local university. Um, so perhaps doing some days um, involved with research in the research project there, um, and so the rest of the time working in a clinical field. Then you get consultant practitioner level, so this is advanced theoretical and practical knowledge, um, and this will be counted as the um, senior clinical, or well, as a reader in some um, universities. And then finally, clinical professor. Um, and as I say, not everybody would want to actually do that, um, but it's the, the opportunity is there that's not been there before. And that's why I find it so exciting. So it, it's available, it needs to be used by people who are interested, and it doesn't matter for those who want to maintain the, the just keep on the clinical level, they can still do that. But there are these opportunities now that were never there before. So that's looking at things from an academic perspective, and that's not for everybody, but I do believe that everyone needs to be involved in one level or another um, in politics, political activity. Now, you can all go, but I'm sorry, but we can't avoid it. The one thing is absolutely certain. We cannot sit passively and let others determine the way we work, the outcomes from the service we provide, the data we collect. You could go on listing that forever. If we just sat back and let people who know nothing about it tell us what we've got to do, that's no good at all. So we have to be proactive. We have to put forward our ideas of how to do things or, or what might be good new services to introduce. We need to think about better ways of working, doing things better or smarter for our patients, because that is still the bottom line. The bottom line is still our patients. 
So in order to do that, we have to understand how the system works. And the system can be in your local place, it can be at a slightly wider level or at a national level. But whatever level it's at, you need to have a certain amount of political nous. And I guess subtle campaigning often works better than in-your-face campaigning, although we can't avoid it in-your-face campaigning sometimes. Um, but we need to engage in it. We can't just sit back and let others do it. Because when you don't like the outcome, you can't whinge about it because you did nothing. But to coin a phrase, we can do it better together. Um, which then brings me to collaboration. And I do really believe the only way forward is collaboration. It has a great number of benefits. It moves you from being a lone worker to a co-worker, even if it's only for some parts of what you do. And that makes life much less lonely. Much less lonely. It's really good to have others to, to bounce ideas around with. And you actually get more done. And although sometimes doing things by committee is not easy, but if, as long as you work well together and you divvy things up, you do get more done. Now, we do collaborate in a great number of ways. So it can be with your local colleagues, with regional groups, with national groups like the Welsh Wounds Network, through societies like Tissue Viability Society, and, of course, on an international level. Um, I was very involved with the International Pressure Ulcer Guidelines the first time round, um, not this time round, because I am supposed to be retired, although I'm not doing a very good job of it at the moment. Um, but it's absolutely fantastic because you've got people coming together from different countries with different ideas, working together for a sole aim. And that's absolutely brilliant. And you learn so much. You might learn bad habits from other people, but you do learn a lot. So my wish for everyone attending this conference is that you gain some information that is relevant to your practice. You identify new research that relates to your patient group. And you have a great time networking, which can only be useful for future collaborations. Thank you very much.